we need to use this time to think. We're not going back. But where are we going? What do we want for our planet, our communities, our future? If we don't answer this question, it will be answered for us and blame shifted from the powerful to the powerless. We need each other now. We need to reflect and reset, strategize, organize, assemble, collective power. This is a network. Join, claim the future. Welcome, everybody. Uh, it's John McDonnell. Um, for those of you who've not um, attended or participated in some of the Claim the Future discussion groups and panel activities, let me just explain very, very briefly. About uh, a number of months ago, at the beginning of the pandemic, um, a number of us got together to talk about the issues that we now face as a community, particularly after 10 years of austerity, but then also the challenges that we faced as a result of the pandemic. And it was to talk about the immediate issues, um, people's health, their safety, the care that they needed, as well as the as well as the number of people that were losing their jobs, being laid off, and others that were being forced back to work in, in conditions that actually put their health at risk. But also it was then a discussion about as we come through this pandemic and after the experience of 10 years of austerity, what sort of society do we want? How and how can we create it? And it, so we decided what we'd do is we'd bring together a whole range of policy experts along with campaigners who were campaigning on the individual issues. And the idea was to integrate that policy thinking, the ideas of those people who are undertaking research from different think tanks, and academic institutions, with campaigners on the ground, so that the campaigns that we were waging uh, gained maximum solidarity across the peace pit so that people were aware of what was going on and we could support one another, but also that the campaigns were nourished with the ideas and the analysis from the policy experts themselves. And so we, de we developed, I think in the end, it was about 14 different panels that were working. We had events like this and, and just bringing people together to talk about a particular issue. And then we brought everyone together again uh, a few weeks ago. And having launched a website, we put up all the individual policy papers on, on the website. So if you Google claim the future, go onto the website and you'll see the individual policy papers. And then I brought it all together in a, a short booklet that's up there as well, um, which else basically sets out the discussions that we've been having. And it is about, it's about changing the paradigm, um, the whole paradigm of, of our discussions around political economy and seeing how we can convince people on the need for change and the type of change that's needed. And it is about, it isn't just a list of policies, it's also about the creation of the sort of the vision of society that we want. Paramount in those discussions was the experience of the pandemic, which brought people together to acknowledge that actually we care for one another and we need one another, and that actually the solutions that we need are based upon cooperation and mutual aid. And yes, the acknowledgement of the role of the state, but a democratically accountable state, an acknowledgement of actually we do have to start challenging values as well. So that just gave the example of health workers and care workers and others, that their worth is not what the market will pay them. Their worth is their true social value. And they're the sort of values of community, and yes, mutuality that we need to build upon if we want to create a new society coming out of this pandemic. And a lot of people have campaigned around the slogan, build back better. Most of us are saying, yeah, we want, to, we want to build better, but we don't want to build back. We don't want to go back to that society, that economy that created so many of our problems that made us so ill prepared for the pandemic when it hit our society, particularly about after 10 years of austerity. That's the, the project itself. It's been, it's been exciting, it's been interesting, and we've been able to bring together people who maybe have never really acknowledged their existence anymore. Also, but when people have planted a flag around a particular issue, we've been able to rally behind them for support, whether that's uh, the Renters' Union and ACORN campaigning against evictions, 
or whether it's individual campaigns, campaigning by trade unions, for example, against the precarious nature of people's work and also some of the things that have hit people with regard to the lack of food supplies, the failure to deliver adequate social care, all of those issues. We found there are people out there campaigning hard for change. So it's been a huge act of solidarity, bringing people together, explaining the issue, discussing it in detail, and then supporting the campaigns for improvement. That's what the Claim the Future project is all about. Today, what we're going to do, we've brought together uh, George Monbiot, who you'll know, who's, a, I suppose, a, one, of the, one of the earliest um, campaigners that, uh, on the environmental crisis that we face and has articulated so well in his books and his speeches and his appearances in the media um, the urgency of, of the climate catastrophe that we face and the, the changes that are required. But in addition to that, we brought Heather Wetzel too from the Labour Land Campaign. Heather's been um, an activist, a local councillor, and working on the Labour Land issue for a number of years and, and become one of the, I think, really articulate advocates about how we our taxation system needs to change to ensure that we we have a fair taxation system based upon land value taxation and also other reforms that are needed. So we thought today what we want to talk about is land. Um, some months ago, well, last year, um, George was involved in the production of a policy booklet called Land for the Many, in which it brought together a whole range of people who were interested in the role of land and the future of land and the future development of policy. It caused quite, it caused quite a stare. It was a, a good discussion about the overall principle about ownership of land, access to land, its role in terms of our environment and its benefits socially that we could be brought about. Um, and it set out not just a, a vision, but set out some detailed policy ideas as well. Things have moved on since then and not necessarily for the better either. And there are some worrying concerns about what the government's doing about changing the planning rules, which um, unfortunately, I think many of us are really fearful now that the planning legislation that they want to introduce will open up the potential of a bonanza for developers that will, first of all, reinforce the unequal ownership and control of land at the moment. So reinforce the power structures within our society that are based upon land, but also put at risk vast tracts of land that actually, instead of for development for profit, should be used as a way in which we can supply ourselves with food, but also ensure that we protect the planet for the long term and provide the, the environmental and cultural pleasures that people get from the countryside in particular. So there are some real anxieties about future of land policy at the moment. So that's why we thought we'd bring together George and Heather to talk that through. And Again, what we'd like to do is have the discussion. Then if people have got questions, by all means, put them put them in the um, chat and we'll deal with some of those questions in the discussion at the end. Always in these discussions, what we've always identified is what's the, what's the issue that we need to be campaigning around? How do we campaign? Who's out there campaigning? And how can we reinforce what they're doing so that we bring about change? And it is about change and the radical change that we need to well create that society of equality and solidarity, I think that we all espouse. So over to George. George, it's over to you to set out the scene. Thanks very much, John. So um, yeah, when we published our report, which is called Land for the Many, and it's online, um, so do, do take a look, because actually it is a really good report. And I can say that because I was only the editor of the report and there were six fantastic experts I was working with who actually knew what they were talking about and together produced some amazing policies. And it was nuanced and it was clever and it was deep. But when we launched it, things just exploded all over the billionaire press. There must've been 50, 60 articles ripping into us. Um, most of which showed no sign of having read the report at all and just making stuff up, you know, inventing all sorts of crazy things. We were, you know, the murder of the firstborn and shipping all the middle class to the Isle of Wight where we were going to put them into some sort of concentration camp and expose them to bubonic plague. I, I exaggerate 
but only slightly. But what it showed us was exactly what we were saying, that the ownership and control of land in this country is absolutely critical to power and wealth in this country and to inequality. And you know, powerful people take this extremely seriously because land has so much to do with sustaining their power. And we kind of proved it with that ridiculous, hysterical, crazy response that we got from the press. Um, but it was at the same time pretty depressing because you think, well, this is what people are reading. This is the only stuff which people are going to read about our report, the great majority of people, because there was, you know, the broadcast media didn't touch it as usual. And, and you just think, you know, obviously, this is a taboo subject. You know, we're told we're trespassers on the land, but we're intellectual trespassers as well as physical trespassers. You know, if we even discuss land when we're not ourselves major landowners, then it's illegitimate. You know, you've got no role here. Clear off. Get off my land. This is my business. I'm the owner of the estate. You've got nothing to do with it. That was you know, very much the vibe that we were getting in response to this report. Yet we have to talk about it. It's absolutely crucial that we do so because literally and metaphorically, land underlies our lives. Um, and if we don't get it right, if its ownership and control have been captured by a tiny number of people, what you get is massive inequality. You get exclusion. You get huge costs of renting or buying a decent home. You get, like John was saying, the collapse of wildlife and ecosystems. You, you even get repeated financial crises. Uh, you get the loss of public space. I mean, there's so many things which land is fundamental to. And yet, for 70 years, this absolutely central issue has scarcely featured at all in our political discussions. And you can see why. We saw why from the response that we got to our report. And so what we tried to do with this report, which was commissioned by Labour, by, by, by John here and John Trickett and other senior figures within the Labour Party who were very supportive of what we tried to do, though you know, it was, to be honest, a struggle within Labour as well as a struggle in the wider nation. But what we tried to do was to put this neglected issue where it belongs, which is at the heart of political debate and discussion. And yeah, it, it, as I say, it's just amazing that we don't talk about it. So, you know, just to give you a few pointers as to what's going on. And since 1995, land values in this country have risen over 400 percent, over four times since 1995. Uh, yeah, that's 25 years. It's incredible. And it now accounts for over half the UK's net worth. You know, if, if people, anyone ever tells you land's a marginal issue, over half the UK's net worth. And, and that's in large part because successive governments have used tax exemptions, all sorts of other advantages to turn the land into a speculative money machine. And when, when, when a council grants planning permission on agricultural land, its value can rise 250 times. And even though that jackpot has been entirely created by society, been created by a political decision supposedly made in the name of the people, the owner gets to keep most of that money. And then we have to pay that owner back. The owner can leverage that incredible gain in wealth um, to charge huge uh, rents and mortgages to basically pay the land values. Um, and, and that's in housing, but similarly with agricultural land, um, um, it's become a massive tax sink. Um, um, so uh, 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 in latest figures, we have 261 families escaping over 200 million pounds in inheritance tax just by owning agricultural land. Um, and what this does is not only not only unfair in a fiscal sense, but it also ensures that farmers are priced out of land ownership. It becomes a speculative asset instead. Um, and with the result that, you know, in just six years, from 2011, where farmers bought 60% of the land on the market, that had fallen to just 40% by 2017 because it was being bought by speculators instead. It's just, you know, we just let this happen. Isn't this incredible? 
Um, capital gains tax, as we know, is lower than income tax. Council tax, proportionately more expensive for the poor than for the rich. And all these tax giveaways, including the fact that the um, whole system is completely opaque, makes land into this really attractive speculative asset. Um, and indeed has helped turn the UK into a magnet for international crime because the land market is absolutely perfect for laundering money for, 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 for the tax reasons, but also for uh, the fact that it's all so opaque. It's so hard to get good, um, effective information on, 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 on land ownership and transactions. And the rest of us pay for this. We pay for these distortions every day. Um, homes have become so expensive, not because the price of bricks and mortar has risen, but because the land that underlies them now accounts for 70% of their price. Um, and the result of that is that 20 years ago, the average working family needed to save for three years to afford a deposit for a mortgage. Now it's 19 years. 20 years is gone from three years to save up to 19 years to save up. And for renters, life's even worse because um, while housing costs 12% um, of average household incomes for people who've got mortgages, for renters, the average now is 36%. It's just an extraordinary proportion. You know, what that means is that a third of the work you do, you're doing for your landlord. You're just giving the money to, to, to your landlord, often a landlord who fails to do repairs, who is, is just creaming it. Um, but because we hear so little about the underlying issues, you know, why, why the whole system is so dysfunctional, instead we blame the wrong causes, as always, for, um, in this case, for the cost and the scarcity of housing. We say, oh, it's immigration, it's population growth, it's the green belt, it's red tape. But in reality, it's the power of landowners and the building companies, their tax and financial advantages, and the vast shift in bank lending towards the housing sector that have inflated house prices so much that even a massive house building program couldn't counteract that inflation. And it means that people will still be priced out of the market even if we build massively more homes. These are structural problems that we face. You can't just build your way out of them. You've got to actually change the political economy if you're going to address these problems. And the same forces are responsible for the loss of public space in cities. Um, uh, the fact that the right to roam in England only covers, what, 8% of the land. Um, the lack of provision for allotments, a lack of opportunity for new farmers, and the wholesale destruction of the living world. And, and so what we, we're trying to do with this report is to confront these structural forces and to say, what would it take to take back control of the fabric of the nation, literally the fabric of the nation. Now, obviously, what it would take would be a Labour government. Um, so uh, we're missing currently that essential element. But, you know, we live in hope and we hope very much that it hasn't died and that, you know, future um, uh, the Labour Party will continue to take an interest in these issues and a future Labour government might pick up some of our proposals because I think they would be transformative. So, for example, we recommend that a Labour government should replace the council tax with a progressive property tax, which is payable by owners, not by tenants. And empty homes should automatically be taxed at a higher rate. Inheritance tax should be replaced with a lifetime gift tax. Capital gains on second homes and investment properties should match or exceed the rates of income tax. So, you know, it doesn't become a speculative haven. Uh, business rates should be replaced with a land value tax, which is based on their rental value, on the land's rental value. And there should be a 15% offshore tax levied on properties that are owned through tax havens, as a huge amount of our land now is. And then we want to democratise development of land and planning. So we want to create new public development corporations. And but alongside local authorities, they'll assemble the land needed for affordable homes and for new communities. Um, and then builders would compete on quality rather than by amassing great big land banks and then basically holding the rest of us to, the, to, 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 to ransom. Um, 
the public corporations would use compulsory purchase to buy land at agricultural prices rather than having to pay through the nose for the uplift in that value that you remember 250 fold uplift sometimes that's created by planning permission and that measure alone would reduce the price of affordable homes in the southeast where the pressure is greatest by 50 percent isn't that incredible you know a really simple policy change could just completely alter the whole structure of the housing market in a way that's highly beneficial, particularly to the people at the bottom of the ladder who can't get their foot on the housing ladder at all. Um, but also we want planning to be much more inclusive. So we propose a community participation agency, which would help people rather than just big companies become the driving forces in creating local plans, influencing major infrastructure, and to you know, get as wide a range of voices as possible heard, we actually suggest a form of jury service for plan making and to represent children and the unborn, who, of course, are always unrepresented. We would like every local authority to follow the Welsh government and appoint a future generations champion. Um, so, so in a way, it's almost the opposite of what the government's intending to do with planning, which is to rip away what few public protections we have and what small democratic voice we have and just hand the whole thing over to property developers who happen to be among the Conservative Party's biggest donors, um, entirely coincidentally. Um, councils, we feel, should also have new duties to create parks and urban green spaces and wildlife refuges and public amenities. And we'd like to see a new definition of public space, which gives citizens a legal right to use that space and overturns the power of private landowners in cities to say um, this might look like a public space, but actually we control it and you're not allowed to busk here and you're not allowed to be a homeless person here and we can control what you do with it, which is a, a sort of shocking thing which is happening throughout our cities now. Um, we would like to see much tighter rent and eviction controls, taking power away from land landlords and handing it over to tenants. and of course, an ambitious social house building program. But, you know, I'd like to emphasize it really isn't just about building. You have to get the structural stuff right. Otherwise, that building isn't going to work. It's not going to solve the problems. Um, we also want to create new opportunities for people to design and build their own homes. And there's a massive unmet need for that. And that would be supported by a community right to buy in England and hopefully um, uh, um, in, in Wales and Northern Ireland as well, of the kind that you already have in Scotland. And Scotland, in many ways, has really been leading the way on some land reform. So even there, I feel it doesn't quite go far enough. Um, compulsory sale orders um, should be used when you've got vacant and derelict plots um, of, of land, which you know are just being sat on by speculators. Bring them back and hand them over or you know give community groups first rights to buy that land so you can actually turn it from being a blight into a community asset and we've got some sort of slight canny and slightly complex ways of trying to um, um uh, other ways of making land prices and and homes more affordable through something uh, we call the common ground trust but I, I, we have, don't quite have time to go into it now um, we call for a right to roam across all uncultivated land and waterways, obviously except gardens and the curtilage of, of buildings and similar limitations. We want to change the Allotments Act to make sure that no one needs wait for a plot for more than a year. And we'd like to use part of the land registry's huge surplus of money, which is built up through means which I th think are not fair at all. I would like to use some of that money to help community land trusts to buy rural land for farming, for forestry, for conservation, for rewilding and the protection of catchments. We'd like to see a new English Land Commission, a bit like the Scottish Commission, which would decide whether to make fa major farming and forestry decisions subject to planning permission um, to help arrest the environmental crisis. And we want to transform the public's right to know by having much more transparent information about land ownership and subsidies and planning published freely as open data. Now, 
these might sound like quite ambitious proposals, but actually in legislative terms, they're, they're really quite simple. And you know, we're not talking about utopia. You know, we're not talking about some place which doesn't exist. We're talking about this place, our land right now, right here, and how it could turn from being something which is used against us to something which is used for us and by us, which is which belongs to us and where we belong to, 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 to the land, where we feel we have a stake in deciding how it is controlled and that it's used for our benefit, not for the benefit of, of speculators and people who are already incredibly rich and powerful. And, and we believe that if, if even half these proposals were introduced, obviously we'd like to see them all introduced, it would make the UK a much more equal and inclusive and generous spirited nation, which instead of being characterised by private enclosure and public squalor, which is basically what we've got today, it would be characterised by private sufficiency and public luxury. Our land should work for the many, not just for the few. Thank you. George, thanks ever so much for that. That was terrific. I remember, um, and you made reference to this at the beginning, but I remember they actually threw the kitchen sink at us, didn't they, with regard to the report? And I, I can remember during the election, well, it was both election campaigns, but the second one in particular, I think it was the Daily Mail or the Express, I can't remember which, they did this huge story about how we were going to tax people's gardens and That's take them off the all the rest. Yeah. <laughs> It was just amazing. And what was interesting, though, is as always on this things, it might have been in a newspaper that is owned by some oligarch and all the rest. But then the BBC take it up as almost it's, as though it's absolute truth you've got to argue about. In the oh, end, if I think that, to be honest, I think it's one of those issues whose time has come. And I agree. In Scotland, they've had campaigns which have been incredibly effective and demonstrated actually with legislative change, you can do things, particularly with regard to absentee landlords up there as well. I agree it doesn't go far enough. What I liked about the report, and this is flattery for you and your team really, is that whenever I was asked a question on it, I could refer straight back to the report. There'd always be an answer. So when, <laughs> when you go on that Today programme at 10 past eight and Nick Robinson's about to demolish you, on this issue, we just had every answer for everything they threw at us, which was terrific. I'll come back to you in the discussion because lots of questions have been coming in about aspects of policy. Um, our next speaker is Heather Wetzel. Heather is from the Labour Land Campaign. As I said before, she's been a real campaign around this issue for a long period of time, working as a local councillor as well, but also um, explaining to people exactly what land value taxation is all about, how effective it could be, and how actually how it could transform not just the discussions about land, but also could change quite dramatically our taxation system to the benefit of everybody. Heather. Well, thank you, John. And I want to say a thank you to you um, because you're one of the few MPs that actually recognises the importance and the relevance of land in the economy. Um, too many uh, members of parliament and in the House of Lords are actually landowners. And I'm talking about big landowners, people like Richard Bennion, former MP, he's not there now, but he stood up in parliament. Um, I can't remember, it was about um, benefits um, a discussion. And he stood up in Parliament and says, I don't like people getting something for nothing. When he and his family have had millions and millions every year through the common agricultural policy uh, subsidies uh, and through their land holdings. Uh, I think they own half of Berkshire. But uh, so it's quite um, it's quite unsurprising, I suppose, that it, the land issue has been lost through Parliament. It's never succeeded in getting through because so many uh, MPs, etc., have got a vested interest. Uh, when we look at the list of problems that we we discuss every day that seem to be getting worse and worse, the poverty that we see today, um, the food banks that I never never imagined would happen in my lifetime, um, children really very hungry in schools, and all the campaigns, the good campaigns that go on about it. Um, our health service doesn't have sufficient funds to provide the sort of quality service that we would like everybody to uh, enjoy. Uh, social care, gaps there, best education, we could put a lot more money into education and other things to help young people 
um, live decent lives, students going out leaving university or college with huge loans, personal debt. Um, and then we have the rich poor divide and the north south divide with the rich and the poor. And those gaps are getting bigger and bigger. And one of the biggest issues, of course, is unaffordable home homes uh, for people to rent or buy. And surely that's a, a, a human right that we should have a home, a decent home, a safe, secure place that we can live in for ourselves and our families, uh, as well as decent food and a decent income and, and by at least the basics in life which we seem to be moving away from. Um, I did some rough figures and something over 50 percent of, of adults are actually not homeowners. We have this myth uh, in our society that suggests that um, we're all homeowners or aspiring to be homeowners. Well we might be aspiring to be but there's a hell of a lot of people are not homeowners. Uh, they live in rented accommodation, they, they're lodgers in, in, in increasing numbers. And of course, very many people in their 20s, 30s and 40s are having to live with their families because they cannot afford to rent or buy. And when you look at villages where people have lived for generations and younger people want to carry on living there, they can't afford to live there. Uh, again, because of things like second homes being um, bought up there, pushing up the price, uh, buy to let, pushing up the price of, of homes. So all these factors seem to be making our society go backwards in terms of equality, justice and fairness. And even when we come up with solutions, they're not really getting down to the nitty gritties of tackling what is wrong. Um, we talk about more subsidies, taxing the rich more, um, but we still end up with a rotten system that is fundamentally flawed. And John, you've mentioned about our tax system and where we campaign on, on, on taxes being wrong. And our tax system is fundamentally flawed. But of course, when you look at the history of taxes, how they evolved, uh, going back before William the Conqueror, the only form of um, taxation was the kings dishing out plots of land, parcels of land to their cronies um, in return for rents in money, building roads, providing education and health care such as it was, and food for the royal courts, etc. So it was the landowners who were the original taxpayers. And then, of course, they thought, we don't like this. So they shifted taxes away from themselves through Parliament as it evolved and over the years, over generations. They shifted taxes off themselves onto merchants and, and also onto workers later on. So they've been very clever and they've had the power of Parliament behind them all the way. And of course, with land, there is the power, the power of ownership of land to use that land, to not use that land, to allow others access to it, be it for farming, be it for homes, be it for jobs, be it for, for leisure. It gives them status because they're big landowners and they get rewarded, or they did in the past, um, when you look at the House of Lords, the hereditary peers, etc. But above all, it gives them a source of unearned income. The Labour Land Campaign was set up in the 1980s by Dave Wetzel and, and some others who actually fully recognised the relevance of land in the, in, in the economy, how land wealth was, was, came about, who creates it, and who receives it and who should receive it. So when we look at land, wealth, as George Monbiot said, it's, it's over, over half of the um, net wealth of the country. I think it's something like five trillion or more pounds. There's a hell of a lot of wealth that people claim as theirs through no action on their part in creating that wealth. Because land wealth only comes about through our joint efforts as workers, as genuine investors in, in, in business, etc. And it's our combined demand for land, whether it's for homes, for businesses, for leisure, for farming, whatever. Well, when we look at our taxes, and John, you're certainly one that's um, gone on about this for years, how taxes are avoided and evaded and, and how terrible it is and the huge amounts that are, are are missed through our system, both legally and illegally. 
and how our tax system actually skews the economy and has enabled this north-south divide and rich-poor divide that are growing. But it also encourages the inefficient use of our land, a natural resource that we should all be sharing in. VAT, income tax are certainly avoided and evaded. Um, business rates are really strange. So I, I always thought of business rates being pretty straightforward. But of course, as you go into the complexities of them, how charities are able to just pay 20% of their business rates bill. So you have the obscene situation where Eton College pays 20% of their uh, business rates, but local state schools pay 100% of theirs because they're not charities. And similarly, with private hospitals, that are registered charities versus the NHS. And you have Oxbridge, of course, between the moaning swathes of land across the country um, with the charitable status of, the, of that land, um, they pay little um, business rates. When you look at supermarkets and recognize how many big supermarkets, certainly in my experience, they're always placed at the back of the site because in the business rates, the distance between the access to the supermarket and the road is a factor in, 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 in a valuation assessment. So they'll move as far away from the main road as they can because they pay lower business rates as a result. Never mind pedestrians or public transport users who have to uh, walk across the car parks. Council tax is quite immoral because it's capped. So you have someone in a three million pound home in the city of Westminster paying the same council tax as someone in the city of Hull in a two, three hundred thousand pound house. So you have these great unfairnesses that are quite obvious. Uh, George has referred to the number of people who are, uh, I was going to say investing, but it isn't. It's pure land speculation, buying up swathes of land buying up flats, leaving them empty. There are blocks and blocks of flats in London and in other cities over the country that are actually empty where people need a decent home. And they're empty, maybe used once or twice a year, maybe not, but they're used, they've been owned for speculative purposes. Bought not as homes, but because the land value, the location value of those flats will increase over time. And they know that that's a sound investment. Subsidies and grants don't work, they capitalise into land value. Um, the CAP, the Common Agricultural Policy, um, over £4 billion a year paid, and it's to the big landowners, the likes of the Duke of Westminster, Serco, James Dyson, who was suddenly decided he wanted to go into farming, and the Saudi prince, racehorse breeder, but he doesn't go to crofters or tenant farms, small tenant farms, etc. goes to the big landowners. Uh, the zero business rates, that ends up with, with land rents actually going up. And buy-to-let mortgages, all that does is push up house prices. The recent stamp duty tax being suspended because of the uh, pandemic is actually we've seen a rise in house sales and house prices. That's because the price can go up because the stamp duty taken off allows the owner to add that value into the price of their property. So subsidies and grants don't work. So if we are going to collect land value, we've got to discuss how we're going to do it. And at the last election, as has been mentioned, um, there were John and the previous election, of course, as a shadow chancellor, advocated business rates being replaced with a land value tax. It was also the policy of the Lib Dems, the Green Party, and certainly um, collection of land values are very much supported in Scotland. Been up to Scotland a few times and, and met people. And uh, land is a very big issue there. They remember the history of the ownership of land and the theft of their land taken away from ordinary folk uh, by the big landowners. And we seem to have forgotten that a lot, in, in certainly in England. Um, Mark Drakeford in Wales is very much an advocate of, of uh, LVT, as is Richard Leonard the um, leader of the Scottish Labour Party. Many more think tanks these days discuss land, the relevance of land, and talk about collecting land rent in some form or another. The Murley's report uh, that the Institute of Fiscal Studies produced a few years back talked about replacing 
count, uh, business rates with land value tax. New Economic Foundation, it periodically comes up in their uh, publications and issues, especially on housing uh, and so on, that we need a land value tax. We need to collect land wealth. Adam Smith Institute, even Tony Blair uh, talked about um, collecting land value uh, not too long ago. So it's not a, it's not a, a left right issue. It's actually a right wrong issue. How you spend the money becomes a left right issue, uh, and that is very important. So today we have um, organisations like Fairer Share that uh, proposes a proportional property tax to play to replace council tax, and then that tax would be based on the capital value of properties. And it wouldn't be capped as with the with the uh, council tax currently is. So people would be paying a fairer share uh, of property. It would pick up. It reflects the land value element because every building has got two values. It's got the value of the structure, um, the condition of it, etc. But it's got the location value, the like the value of the land on which that building sits, and that's what we're interested in. We want to have beautiful buildings. We want to have environmentally sound buildings, um, where there where there's planning permission. Um, but it, we're concerned with land value. There's an all-party parliamentary group on land value capture, which looks at the wider aspects of, of land value capture. So it's certainly a growing area of discussion. We see more and more articles. You mentioned about the garden tax, and the Times was one of those who pilloried uh, John and the Labour Party for for discussing about collecting uh, land value, and indeed they misquoted um, something from the Labour land campaign in their uh, rambles about garden tax, where we're going to nick it back garden, forgetting, of course, that. Um, there's an element of land value in council tax, and certainly there is in business rates currently. Landowners are very powerful people, and um, we must never forget that. Uh, when we look at land value, how is it? How does it arise? And as we've said, it's it's over half the net worth of the UK. Well, it's our combined demand to use land for homes, for businesses, for farming, for leisure, etc. So we all create land value. And of course, we want to live or have businesses located where there's good public transport, where there's good public services, education, healthcare, where there are parks, etc., etc. Good roads, access to airports, all the things that we want as society. So it's our combined, deba our combined demand for land that actually creates the value, gives it its value. But at the moment, who gets it? Well, of course, owners of land get it. And who should get it? Well, we argue that we should all get it. And we're all taxpayers at some level, even the poorest of the poor pays tax at some level. So we all contribute to that land wealth. And we argue um, now that an, an annual land value tax on all land is actually the best way to collect uh, land wealth. Some of us also might argue that land should be held in common, as of course it was when you go back far enough, and we use it um, for the benefit of all society, remembering social needs, economic needs, and environmental needs, and protecting our land and using it efficiently and effectively. But of course, we know about the garden tax reaction. And, and if you started talking about land being held in common, again, even though it's a product of nature, if I said I own the air in, in, in West London, if you want to breathe air, you've got to pay me rent, you'd laugh me out of the door. And yet we accept it with land. If we want to use land, we've got to pay a landowner. So an annual land value tax has got a procedure and we've looked at it. And the first thing is, of course, complete a land register. We need to know who claims to own our land. Then all land needs to be valued for its optimum permitted use. And that is what the local community wants. And this is where we do need very good planning reforms uh, that are based on, on local need, that are based on the environment to make sure that land is used carefully, sparingly. And um, the, the projects that developments actually benefit the whole of the local society. So it's value the land for its optimum permitted use. 
And then a rate would be levied. And the levy would depend on the government of the time, if they want to be revenue neutral, or if they want to increase income uh, for local and national government. There certainly needs to be an equaliser put in, as with uh, rates, etc., because, of course, uh, an acre of land in Westminster is worth considerably more than an acre of land in the Highlands of Scotland. Um, and we say on all land, including farmland. And there's a farmer, Duncan Pickard, who lives in Scotland, who advocates land value tax. Now, he, he owns his own farm, but he also rents farm from the retired farmer next to him. And currently, Duncan pays no rent for that farm. He doesn't fork out a penny. His rent is actually the common agricultural policy uh, receipts that he receives for farming that land, that goes to that owner, which just proves that, that subsidies capitalise into land value. So his rent is actually, we're paying his rent. And he argues that it's a totally inefficient system and he's a farmer. We have idle development sites that blight our towns and cities, going up and up in value, eyesores, tips, used for raves, etc., denying access to the homes that is that planned for there or the business that are planned for those sites. Those idle development sites are terrible because they go up and up in value. The owners want the roads so they can access their sites. They want all this public services, but they don't want to pay for them. Empty and underused buildings. We could use our buildings much more efficiently, especially in these days and with, with, with IT, etc. And there are huge benefits, economic, social and environmental, with a land value tax. And it's the owner of the land that needs to pay uh, land value tax. And of course, the costs that are of, um, applied to a site are reflected in, in, in the rental value. So if you've got a small but beautiful building in the middle of the centre of London, and it's wanted to be conserved, that building, you might not be able to make a fortune as a business, but that that beautiful building does need to be conserved. And um, that's another argument for, for land value tax and taking taxes off of buildings um, and encouraging good building. And if we're going to um, change the use of office blocks into homes, not to build little boxes that's ha happening currently, we need good planning for good quality homes that are good sizes for families to live in not shoe boxes. One of the big uh, benefits of a land value tax will actually be the stopping of land speculation and land hoarding. People have to pay the full economic rent of that site, then they're not going to keep it out of use. If they own if they own a flat, they'll make sure it's rented out at a proper rent. But it also makes premises more affordable to rent or buy, be they homes or be they business premises. In our country, we've got skills and talents that are lost because people cannot afford to rent premises. And we're losing those skills and talents, but if, if premises became more affordable, then we would see those people being able to set up their own business or partnerships or cooperatives, and, and that would benefit all of society. And that would lead to more local production of goods and services, and less transporting, the lorries that are um, environmentally damaging, et cetera, et cetera, and all the road accidents that are caused as a result. So more localization and production of uh, goods and services. It provides a sustainable source of income for local government and, and national government for our public services to maintain them, to improve them, to develop them. So we've got the best public services that we can possibly have. The more that bad taxes are replaced by LVT, so the economy will become fairer and less skewed. Now, we could go straight in and have all land straight away uh, with a land value tax and, re and get rid of all other taxes. But it, common sense would say to do it step by step. So we have things like um, the fairer, uh, proportional um, property tax or replacing council tax and business rates. Those are quite obvious ones. There's a lot of data there on who owns land already uh, for um, council tax business rates, common agricultural policies, data, planning applications. So the, the, 
most land is actually we know who owns it and it could be easily valued and because of the skills that already exist particularly in local government in terms of valuing uh, land valuing properties and applying the the rate and with the uh, equalizer in so yes we need a land value tax. Ultimately, I would argue all bad taxes, all those taxes that are avoidable, evadable, that skew the economy, need to go. They need to be replaced with an annual land value tax. But at least in the short term, let's look at replacing business rates and council tax. And remember that we all generate land wealth, not a landowner sits there, does nothing and their land goes up in value. And certainly we've seen that with, with um, expensive projects like Crossrail um, in, in London, the Jubilee Line extension, where land goes up millions and millions because new um, public expenditure, expenditure uh, is improvements in our, in our public uh, services and public transport is very obvious. After the recovery from coronavirus, uh, I've written a brief article and um, we could learn a lesson from San Francisco, the 1906 earthquake and fires, etc., where the, um, the, the politicians of San Francisco actually didn't give uh, breathing space to landowners. They said, no, we're charging the full economic rent and they encouraged people. It was an incentive to bring those those sites into use to new buildings, etc. And they gave the city new money to build parks and public sector housing etc that was something new uh, there's many organizations as i said it's not a, a left right issue it is a right wrong issue land is a product of nature no one of us has created and certainly no landowner land wealth we all generate we all create it uh, as workers and we want to see a shift onto land wealth, the unearned incomes that owners of land, and indeed other natural resources, be it the spectrum, um, our waters, seas, etc., airwaves, so on. Let's look at it and think about where the money that we all create as workers, as taxpayers, where that money goes, and so much of it goes into land. And let's give the power back to the people to benefit economically, socially and environmentally from the land that we all should own, at least that we all deserve. Thank you. Thanks, thanks Heather. <clears throat> Terrific. Thank you so much. We'll come on to some questions now. It's interesting, um, one of the group um, that wrote the report, by the way, so people have asked on the chat, how can they get hold of the report? We've put it up on the on the in the chat so people can literally google it and go online it's easily readily available uh, land for the many that george has been referring to um guy shrubshaw was involved in those discussions george can you remember and he produced a book on who owns <coughs> who owns the land and one of the funniest things i thought from that he did a presentation to us at a conference we had up in um lincoln i think heather you were there and he, he, he said, well, I'll start on the examination of ownership with his own constituency, where he came from. And then he went and examined it. It was Richard Benyon's. He discovered that Richard <laughs> Benyon actually owned the whole of the, the constituency. Yeah. It was the sense of irony about the scale of ownership by so small a number of people as well. That was quite remarkable. Um, let's just address some of these issues that have been thrown up on the, in, in the chat. This issue of population always gets asked. You know, is it, isn't it about intensity of population, dense population as against the land itself? That's one of the issues themselves that set up. Um, the other thing that came up as well, George, this is specifically for you really, is what do you think about the government's new sustainable pl farming plan that they've just recently published at post CAP, I, I suppose, as well? And also, um, Heather, particularly for you as well, this issue, about replacing other taxes has come up time and time again and how much LVT can do that and depending obviously what, what the scale of it is. And the other issue that's come up as well in the chat is the role of um, the role of cooperatives, but also what ideas have we got about preserving public spaces within cities and towns as much as anything. George, can you open up on those? Sure. Um, well, maybe I'll start with population. Um, and 
it's a common misconception that housing demand is driven by population growth. Um, uh, actually, and many people will be astonished to hear this, um, the ratio of housing to households is greater in this country than it has ever been. There is more housing by comparison to the number of households than there's ever been before, but it's highly concentrated. And by that, I mean that lots of people own multiple homes, rich people owning multiple homes, um, second, third, fourth homes. It's really an outrage um, when there are so many people who are homeless or underhoused, but also um, rich people under occupying large properties. So um, um, houses with loads of rooms in and one or two people rattling around in them. Whereas you know, some fairly simple policies, um, tax policies primarily, could actually redistribute that housing much more effectively than it is today. And that's combined with a lack of effective demand. Um, uh, and what that means is that people don't have the money to afford houses, however many there are. And, and there's some extraordinary figures showing, you know, even if you built a million homes a year, you would still only reduce house prices by 7% um, because um, of, of the, the, the whole structure of, of the land market that I was talking about dur during my presentation. Um, and so it's, it's a really simplistic thing, you know, that there is, the whole debate is dominated by wrong-headed and simplistic ideas, which is, oh, well, we'll just build our way out of it. We just build more homes uh, or it's because there's too many people, especially all those immigrants coming over here, taking our homes, that, that, those sorts of ideas. And, and they are totally wrong headed because they totally fail to grasp the structural reasons for why people can't afford housing in this country, which has nothing to do with either of those factors at all. And, and so you know, we, we do explain this in Land for the Many, you know, have a look at it online. Um, we've set up our own website. It's just called Land for the Many. Really, re and you know, it's it's a simple, simply written, accessible report, but it does get into these comparatively complex structural issues. Now, on the farming thing, I mean, as far as I can see, just about the only benefit of leaving the the EU um, is getting out of the Common Agricultural Policy, which is a total catastrophe. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm I call myself a Eurosceptic Remainer. Um, I voted Remain, but I see a lot of things wrong with the EU. Um, and But top of my list, absolutely top of my list, is this common agricultural policy, which basically gives huge amounts of money. 40% of the entire EU budget is given to landowners, and it's basically given to landowners for owning land. So it's, it's the most regressive form of public spending just about on earth today. You know, it's quite amazing. You know, all taxpayers whatever station in life, are pouring money into this pot, which is then given disproportionately to the richest people of all. And when I say the richest people, I don't just mean the richest people in the EU. Many of them are the richest people in the world because they include oil shakes from Saudi Arabia and mining barons from Texas and um, and, 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 and you know, Russian oligarchs, people from all over the world who have um, poured into the European land market, including the UK market, because um, of the incredibly generous tax treatment, but also the subsidies which they get just for owning land. They get paid for owning the land. It's just extraordinary. But also this is, is highly perverse in terms of um, its environmental impacts, because the land you get paid for owning is land which is in agricultural condition. You don't actually have to grow anything at all. You don't have to produce any food to get paid for it, but it has to look as if food could be produced there. And, and what that means, agricultural condition, uh, translated into English, means bear. If you've got wildlife habitats on that land, it doesn't qualify for farm subsidies. So what they've created is this massive perverse incentive for clearing wildlife habitats off the land. And across Europe, it's led to hundreds of thousands of hectares of prime wildlife habitat being destroyed for no reason other than harvesting subsidies. It's an absolute outrage. It's one of the most destructive forces on earth today. Um, so is the, the, the UK's post-Brexit um, farm subsidy policy going to be any better? Um, 
it, it would really struggle to be worse. You know, you would really have to go to great lengths to make it worse than the common agricultural policy. Now, I wouldn't necessarily put it beyond this government, which seems to be pretty good at, um, at finding the worst possible outcome can be extracted from any policy that it puts its hands on. But on paper, at least, it looks like a major improvement, where basically... In theory, um, landowners will be um, uh, uh, paid for uh, delivering public goods. It'll be public money for public goods. There will be a cap on the amount of money which anyone can receive, so it won't be as regressive as the current system is. The great problem with it, as I see from my point of view, is in implementation. Because what we've seen this government doing, and indeed successive Tory governments doing, has been absolutely slasher, slashing regulatory capacity. Um, so if you look at you know what's happened to the Environment Agency, the Rural Payments Agency, Natural England, they've all been cut to the bone. You know, they've lost a, a vast proportion of their budget, a vast proportion of their staff. They're basically now dysfunctional. They can't do their job at all. Now, this whole new program which the government has proposed is totally dependent on effective monitoring and enforcement. But because the government is, is so constitutionally allergic to actually putting money into monitoring and enforcement and, and turning re regulation, which means public protection, into something meaningful, then what we could see is, um, is a really a sort of reversal to the, the, the bad old days of just giving people money for owning land. Are you the owner of the land? You say you're doing what, what, what we're asking you to do. Fine, here's the money. We're not going to actually check that you're doing it because we don't have the capacity to do that. So we'll just give you the money. That, that's what I fear will be the outcome. Um, I'll, I'll hand over to Heather, if I may, for, for, for the answers on, on, on some of the other questions. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I, I the think change, change proposed, proposed is that me? Is that me? On the on uh, farm the, uh, properties, farm properties is really interesting. Really interesting. Um, and I look forward to seeing more on that, how that's going to work. But of course, it's only, it's only suggesting that uh, they do what they should be doing now as stewards of, of the land. They should be looking after it and caring for it. Uh, and that's one thing that that farmer that I refer to, Duncan Pickard, um, who supports LVT on farms, and I'm totally opposed to the CAP or any subsidies for farming. Um, he's always argued that it would encourage farm, farmers not to farm at the margin, and to also release land to new farmers, um, it, would, it would make it better because farming needs new farm, new young people coming into farming. As regards replacing taxes, what I didn't emphasise is taxes and land value are actually inversely related. And as you increase taxes, so you reduce land value. As you reduce taxes, so you increase land value. So you can replace it's not an additional tax, it's a replacement tax. And instead of land value, which currently is sucked out of, out of our economy by owners of land, and um, not just people living in this country, of course, as you've said, these overseas speculators buying up more and more land. So as you change the tax system and shift it off, off of those taxes onto land value, then the wealth that we create will be brought back in. But it, it won't increase uh, taxes overall. Um, it will replace, because of this relationship, uh, they're re inversely related. Um, co-ops, I think co-ops are brilliant in all aspects. Um, and, and I think if we have more affordable premises, then there's more chance for more afford, more um, co-ops being set up, they, the chance, and also in terms of farming, etc. On the conservation of public spaces in towns, I mean, George, you, you talked about this, this um, modern enclosures, really, isn't it, of our, our towns and cities, the areas that are taken over, and um, we're not allowed to do this, not allowed to do that. And I think that's totally wrong and immoral and, and that should be returned, but that's a separate issue. But certainly things like green spaces, and I think this is where planning, good strong planning comes in. Um, you know, when you drive around, a, a go around a town or, or city, I live in West London, you know, which is quite densely built, you see a little square of land that was built perhaps uh, an estate in the 30s or 20s, 
and there's this little bit of land and it makes such a difference the green space mm -hmm. and that should be essential in, in, in all new developments that there must be green spaces in our towns and cities and things like urban farms wildlife areas conserved etc etc that needs to be encouraged uh, and one way to do that is to use land value tax and good strong planning so um i don't know if that answers all the things i think we do need to use uh, about the dense population we do need to use our cities and towns more efficiently uh, there's loads of uh, underused empty buildings and i've said about the numbers of flats that are standing empty um <laughs> is that your cat no, I'm standing no, empty purely because of land speculation you know it's wicked isn't it and then there's pressure to build on on green land on green belt land on green land in farms etc uh, while these flats and homes etc stand empty so we should be using our buildings more efficiently and using our land more efficiently and conserving and protecting not just for us but for generations to come i've noted cats have a particular thing around zoom and webinars and all that everyone I've, i know has got a cat all of a sudden the cat appears and, and goes on whatever and we call our cat tosca because she jumps everywhere but there you are anyway <laughs> <laughs> uh, on the actually it came up in the chat about empty houses as well and the from Labour Housing, they said, although we've got a relatively low vacancy rate in the rest of Europe, there's still out there nearly three quarters of a million empty properties. And a lot of that, I hope people always accuse me of relating everything back to my constituency. It's a bit like midsummer murders, but it's true. In exactly what's happened, is, as Heather has said, in my constituency, Crossrail is going through, land prices have gone through the roof. A lot of it is and people buying to speculate and a lot of it is around foreign ownership as well actually and and it, it is they can leave the premise open and still make a fortune without even renting the property out and mm. that's time and time again it's interesting because of the lack of planning controls as well that there is and also conservative councils in some instances have to say, the nature of the properties as well as what they can sell quickly so one bedroom or two bedroom and not family properties and then you look at the estates that are going up and I, you know, these are looking like the slums of tomorrow because they're so lacking in community. Mm. Land mm. value would, taxation would sort that out because all those billions we're spending of public money on Crossrail is actually being used to enhance the profits that these landlords will make. In the chat, someone asked about what's the claim the future's discussion around landlordism. Well, the housing debate that we had came down to, and it was an excellent paper written by Andrew Fisher, um, that came down to reminding us that Keir Hardy, when he campaigned, he campaigned for socialism and the end of landlordism. So what, it's interesting how the debate around the renters campaign has moved beyond just, not just ending evictions, but rate controls, and now moving on to actually, yes, let's end, let end landlordism. So you limit the number of properties any individual or any individual can own, and then you also end the corporate um, ownership of, of properties too in that way. I think it's it sounds it sounds quite radical, but I think radical solutions are needed. And it's it's interesting that it's come onto the agenda. Just for both of you, one of the questions that asked is what is uh, in other European countries, what is the have we are there lessons to be learned there? Are there other practices that we should be drawing upon, either in terms of the land use issues or around taxation that, that would help us in this debate. Hmm. So, well, so, yeah, um, one, um, one country which has made great strides since 2004 has been Scotland. You know, it is, it is quite amazing to see the difference either side of the border in the way that land is discussed and treated. Um, and, and, you know, as I said in my presentation, Scotland's not perfect. There's mm -hmm. a lot of stuff missing there but it's begun to put in place some of the structural change which, which needs to happen, um, particularly with things like community right to buy, with compulsory um, um, purchase orders, stuff like this, which um, are, are you know, the, the building blocks of it. And, and the comprehensive right to roam, which is introduced there, which really sort of is symbolically, I mean, it is practically very important because it allows people to actually go somewhere, go places to, to walk 
um, in the land, but it's also symbolically very important because it says this land is ours. It says we we belong to this nation and the nation belongs to us because there's not some bloke with a shotgun saying, get off my land. Because actually, to uh, even though your name might be on the deeds, to an extent, it's all of our land, you know, and 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 you know, I I would go so far as to question you: know, Why is it even possible for people to own land, something which nobody ever made? Um, and you know, when you look at the philosophy of land ownership, it just none of it really makes any sense at all. Um, and um, but you know, obviously, you know, Labour would struggle to put that forward part uh, the, 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 that forward as policy. But but you know, in Scotland, you begin to sort of tilt that back towards the people um, and so you have much more of a sense of 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 public ownership of, uh, and, and you know in the true sense not just ownership through the state but ownership you know of, uh, sort of uh, psychologically this belongs to you and me this land belongs to you and me there is a much more of that sense which I think is absolutely crucial for a sense of progressive nationhood and I think that one of the reasons why the sort of right has captured the notions of nationhood, particularly in England, is that there is so little in the way of inclusive nation, nationhood. And that's something which is being addressed to an extent in Scotland. Uh, but there are many good examples um, from elsewhere in Europe, and I'm, I'm sure Heather would, uh, can, can, can furnish some of those. The development of community of land trusts, I think, is something that would appeal right the way across the political spectrum in terms of community activity, definitely, in terms of people wanted to protect it and by doing so own it as a community rather than allow individual ownership. And I think there's real potential there. Heather, what about European examples on taxation? Um, gosh, I'm not an expert on this, but I do know mm. that in one jurisdiction in Germany, they've just ventured into land value tax and I, mm. I couldn't tell you how effective it is, but it's certainly something that's been discussed very much and certainly throughout the world. Um, variations are on i mean in china for instance all land is owned by the state and leases are sold now they're collecting an element but of course if you've got a lease that's 70 40 70 years old when you look at how china's economy has gone up in that the last sort of 20 years um they're not collecting the land value now they're collecting the the the, the rent then so you still got the privatization of land rent um, through the whoever uh, has bought those leases. Um, when you look at Hong Kong and, and how the airport, the new airport was built through uh, land value capture and their metro system was through land value capture. That's what they used to pay for those public services. Um, um, we went to Harrisburg uh, some years back. Uh, they had a two tier property tax and there's quite a few areas in um, um, in America that go for a two-tier property tax. So you have one element on the building and one element on the land. And of course, in Harrisburg, they reduced it, the element on the, the, the levy on the buildings and increased it on the land. And it brought that those sites into use. It was the in the Rust Belt and it was the donut thing where the middle classes moved out and um, empty buildings, lots of fires, vandalism, etc., and high unemployment. But by imposing a land value tax, people were encouraged to refurbish their buildings because they had the bill to pay for the location value. So the refurbished building, the buildings, they built on the uh, um, development sites that got planning permission, but were sort of standing as car lots, um, parking places or whatever. And it it revived the economy. And if you do that, that principle is what we advocate. And another thing on empty homes, of course, Second homes and holiday lets are leaving villages, and particularly, you know, where we go for our holidays, you go there in the winter and you'll find they're dead and empty and people are pushed out of those areas uh, because of second homes. I'd like to put um, a lot of landlords out of, out, of, um, out of the singing by building more and more council homes by encouraging cooperatives uh, to be set up in building homes and housing associations that are genuine uh, for the benefit of the tenants. But, you know, we need a variety of social housing. I'm not per se against private landlords. What I am against is people who are land speculators and um, are bad landlords, of course. Uh, we need a lot more changes 
there. But I think put them out of business um, with particularly uh, council homes. And mm -hmm. land value collected would give local authorities um, the income to build new homes. Mm -hmm. There's a couple of final points, sort of thing. There's a question is, do we need a, re, a, a new legal definition of public space in particular? Um, the other issue is, you know, what, what is your assessment of what's going to happen under this government and what will happen with Greenbelt in particular? And what's the balance of forces there in relation to those that are advocating on behalf of the uh, major builders about incursions? into the green belt and the other issue as well is what do you think next how do how do, can people move this forward what are there successful examples of how communities have been mobilized in this way and how should we go about now taking the whole issue of land and trying to get it more centrally into political community debate george do you want to kick off Yes, um, so I'll, I'll talk particularly on the legal definition of, pu of public space. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, it's amazing that there isn't one um, and there isn't legally defined public space in, in this country. You know, it's all basically done with just sort of common agreement. And then you suddenly find out there isn't a common agreement because the private landowner has decreed that um, um, this is only public space in certain respects and they've got private security guards patrolling it to ensure that undesirables can't use this space and basically you can't stop in this space and you can only really use it if you're shopping. You know, as long as you're going from, from shop to shop with bags, buying stuff, you, you're welcome. Everybody else can bog off because, you know, we're here to maximise the, the, um, the, 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 the footfall um, for consumption and you know that suddenly you discover that what purports to be public space is nothing of the kind and so what we call for here is is a public realm use class which defines public space that citizens have the, the right to use for civic and cultural purposes and it would be a planning requirement and this ties in with what Heather was saying um, in all new developments with open space, that that would be um, classified as public realm use class but I'd also obviously like to see a lot of what purports to be public space actually solidified as genuine public realm. Um, and again, it's, it's this sense of, you know, who does this nation belong to? Who is this nation for? Who are we? Are we citizens or are we the subjects, not just of the monarch, but of a bunch of property developers? Because that's how it feels at the moment. And how it feels is absolutely crucial to the conception and formation of nationhood. Um, and if this feels like a, a, an aristocratic realm, which I'm afraid it does at the moment, then we sort of give in to that, those aristocratic powers. But if this feels like a nation which belongs to us, then we treat it as such and we start to grow into that nation and we create the uh, idea of progressive nationhood, which is absolutely essential if we're not to turn towards some dystopic um, 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 nation um, creation of nation throughout this century. You know, we've got to reclaim the idea of nationhood, and so much of that lies in the e e egalitarian and progressive use of land. Mm. Heather, 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 all, all, all joining join the Labour campaign. I'm sorry. I've got apart echo from, there. Okay. Apart from, all, <laughs> apart from all joining the Labour land campaign, oh. how, do we, how do we move this forward? Well, I think things are moving forward. Um, I would say in the last 10, 20 years, there's a lot more talk about land and its relevance in, in the economy and the wrongs, et cetera, et cetera, and green belt issues. And when you look at some of the um, campaigns where people... Um, oppose the building of this or crossrail or um, developments, you know, that's the local people rising up and saying, you know, we don't want this in our area. This is bad for our, not just locally, but bad for the for the environment, for our, for our nation. So I think we need a lot more of that. And I think we need a lot more, um, I think, look, to Scotland, I think Scotland's a super example on discussing land. Uh, but I said they haven't forgotten their history. We, we seem to have forgotten our history on land ownership. Uh, but people like yourself, John, we need more 
people in Parliament that will actually stand up um, when we used to, when the Labour land campaign used to stand up and talk about land value tax or members of it or the parties or wherever, we got laughed out. We were sneered at. Oh, you're a bunch of Georgists, you know, you're cranks. But that is fading away. And, and when you look at the classical economists, of course, um, they advocated uh, uh, land value tax as, as the good tax and the basis of taxation. So I think we need to do more of what we're doing, but there needs to be a lot more of it. But I do think the power has got, the, the, the efforts got, the power is in the, in the hands of ordinary folk on their local communities. And I think need to be standing up for stronger planning um, on all these issues uh, and more on why our current taxes are bad and exposing how people are exploiting workers, exploiting the whole system um, by their own tax evasion. They want the services, they want a well-educated workforce, they want public services, but they don't want to pay for them. And the more we shout about that, so I, I think all those things together uh, and, and you know, there's the all there's the all party parliamentary group, and I'd like to see them become more vocal um, mm. on the issue right across the political spectrum. I agree. I think the you mentioned Henry George. It's quite interesting the lack of political education in this country as well. But Henry George was actually an influencer on some of the very early socialists that from the Labour Party. His ideas mm. were extremely well known at that time as well. And a lot of it is not has really faded out of almost been written out of history. And part of the discussion we've been having with different groups is the need for again political education, but based upon the history of the various common struggles that have taken place. What's been great, for example, is the revival of the um, the Diggers Festival up in up in Wigan around Jared Wood Stanley and that sort of thing has been really interesting. The work that Guy Standing has been doing around the Commons as well has been been really been really useful and is the Charter of the Forests that he, um, yeah. we did a discussion around that. Then someone told me actually it was a forgery, but never mind. I think it's, it doesn't matter. It make, makes the point itself. And so I think that what we'll try and do is move this forward in some of the discussions. One other issue really that, that came up for me, Owen Hathaway has done his book um, recently published on the history of London local government. And he asked me to one of his sessions to talk about the GLC period. And it reminded me, or he reminded me then, of the battles that we had from local government over sites in London in particular. And he reminded me of Coin Street when we owned Coin Street at the GLC and passed it across. And I can remember the night because uh, the government was taking our powers away at midnight and we got the land transferred to the Coin Street local group minutes before midnight and there was a there was a thunder clap it was almost as though someone was applauding <laughs> it's still there it would have been in office blocks but it's there now with homes and community center etc and i just think in the discussions we're going to be doing stuff on constitutional change in the new year talking about federalism and and what's happening in wales and scotland as well but it does mean about actually arguing about the powers of local government and regional government and the ability of those acting as agencies to buy and own land and then transfer it back to the community itself. So I agree with that there's a whole debate that's happening now. It's going to, it will evolve us into people actually then launching their individual campaigns that we can support. And it will bring them up against, it will bring them up against developers and landowners and any party or government that protects them as well. I think. I agree with you. It has, it, it's, it is, it has moved on, but I think we're now at that stage where people are looking for some something, maybe a, a, a break about the whole issue. And of course, overlying all of it is the potential threat of climate catastrophe. So again, it's yeah. actually your first one on that on that land debate. Anyway, can I thank you both for participating in in this? It's been really good. Um, can John, are you advocating a second peasants revolt now? I, well, I, I always have done. You know that because I. <laughs> <laughs> but it's that interesting. All land. these all these individual campaigns that are taking place around um, individual pieces of land where developers yeah. now are exercising their influence, 
And I think actually developers with the with the Conservative government that we've got at the moment, some of them think this is a major opportunity for them with planning laws being watered down, etc. And I think that will provoke, it will, pro, it already is, it will provoke resistance to some of these things. It will open people up to a wider debate now about land itself, its ownership, and then also issues around taxation as well. So there's an opportunity here, I think, that we've got to seize, but it will, and as in all these things, change in this country doesn't come about usually as a result of quiet debate in Parliament. It does come about as a result of communities campaigning and yeah. as much on the streets as it does in any parliamentary halls as well. So yeah. I think that's almost inevitable in in this coming period. And as I say, overlying all of that is the threat of climate change. And I think we move from the crisis of the pandemic into the real discussion of the existential threat that we now face with that crisis. So, yeah, there's my, I, my view. We've got this is the point you make. We've got to facilitate that discussion as much as possible and get more people standing up in, in council chambers and park elsewhere to reflect what, what's going going on. Now, thank you both. It's been really it's, it's been really interesting. And from what I've seen in the yeah. chat, you've excited an awful lot of interest. Um, I I was trying to find Guy, uh, Guy Shobsall's book, um, and I found it the other day again, and I thought it was a really good piece of work mapping out the ownership, et cetera. But I'm, uh, um, underneath Guy's book was Andrew Fisher's book he did in 2014, yeah. The Failed Experiment. And Andrew was the person who wrote the last couple of manifestos. And he dealt with land in it and he raised land value tax. Yeah. But also the best quote that I really liked about land, he quotes Woody Guthrie. And he says, US folk singer Woody Guthrie would have been proud. His most famous song is This Land is Your Land. Yep. But rather less well known is the rebellious ending, and it's this from Woody Guthrie. As I went walking, I saw a sign there, and on the sign it said private property, but on the back side it didn't it didn't say nothing. That side was made for you and me. And I thought that was <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks ever so much. I'm hoping people who okay. participated enjoyed yeah. it and whatever. It's really good to see you both. Anyway, all, all the right. best. Thank you. Thanks all. very much, John. Thanks, Bye. Heather. Bye. 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 We need to use this time to think. We're not going back. But where are we going? What do we want for our planet, our communities, our future? If we don't answer this question, it will be answered for us and blame shifted from the powerful to the powerless. We need each other now. We need to reflect and reset, strategize, organize, assemble, collective power. This is a network. Join, claim the future. <laughs>